But it's a pleasure to be here. It's really an honor to be here. It's interesting because a lot of people, they always say, how'd you get here? Why'd you get here? And uh, it always comes back to the General Motors story. And I know Joe's here, but General, I, one of my businesses was a Chevy dealership. And the Chevy dealership, one day in 2009, I got the letter that said it was being taken away from me. I thought that was just a, a grievous situation. I, I mean, American capitalism under attack. Why would my dealership be taken away from me? And quite frankly, that's why I'm here. Um, it's one of the reasons that, that I gave up my businesses back home and came down here. But what's interesting is I look back at my business, his successes and some failures, and we all know that you have failures and successes when you have multiple businesses. But many of those successes came from teaming up with people, from, from having partners. And I, I got here and I started to realize that many of my partners and many of my business associates, I couldn't tell you whether they were Democrat, I couldn't tell you whether they were independent, I couldn't tell you who they were, because what we always did was we had a common purpose and we moved forward under that common purpose. But what I noticed down here, what happens is we don't have a common purpose. We say we do in a lot of cases, but we don't move forward together. So when I first got here, I, I swore all that off and I said that I'm going to be a solutions person. I'm going to come down here and, and work towards solutions. Um, I was fortunate enough to get on financial services, fortunate enough to start working um, and really start to see this volume of hand grenades back and forth and say, I'm not going to be a part of that. I'm going to be a part of solution-based getting things done. And, and one of the uh, Congress people from the other side, John Carney, walked up to me one day and said, you know what? Um, a couple of guys are talking about you. We've got a, got a lot of respect for you because you never throw a hand grenade over the other side. You never say anything bad about us. You're just worried about the facts. You're just worried about getting to the, to the solutions. And I thought, well, that's what we're here for. That's part of the reason we're all here. So I said, why don't we have breakfast? And John and I um, had breakfast. And I started to talk to him and realized that he was talking the same kind of solutions I was. Now, maybe a different way, maybe a different idea, maybe a different thought, but we all had the same ideas of where we were trying to get to. And I thought back in my business days, that's exactly what we tried to do back then. So I said, John, you must have some, some friends that have similar thoughts over on your side, and I do too, let's have another breakfast. And we did, we, a couple weeks later, we had another breakfast, and there were two or three other um, Democrats showed up and two or three other Republicans that I brought along, and we had a, um, a great discussion, and, and then we decided, John and I, that we we're gonna start putting this group together, six or eight people. Well, what happened from that point on is I started getting members walking up to me at the floor, on the floor and saying, hey, you know, I hear you guys are really doing some good things. I'd like to be a part of the group. And I always have to tell you, because one member came up to me, and, and he, he'd probably chuckle if, I, if he knew I'd say this story, but I didn't even know who he was. He says, <laughs> he was from the, the other side, he said, I want to be part of your group. And I said, great. I said, I'll tell my staff. And I go back to my staff, and I say, hey, I don't know, there's a guy on the floor who wants to be part of the group to go lose there. I don't know. <laughs> so I got my book and I started looking into the book. And, and I saw the picture. I said, well, this is the guy. And they go, oh, he would never want to be part of your group. I said, you're kidding me. I said, he's a nice guy. I said, you contact your staff because he wanted to be part of my group. And as uh, we contacted him, here was Peter Welch. And Peter now is, is part of the group. And it's, he's become a great addition to it. And uh, it, it's... It's a great group because here's what the group does. We get together about every three weeks. We're not a formal group, and we're not a caucus, because we're just, we're just getting together to talk about ideas. We have three things that we say. When you come in that group, in, the, in that breakfast, and we call it the breakfast club because it's always breakfast. When you come there, you take your hat off, whether you're Republican or Democrat. You know such thing when you walk in. No idea is a bad idea. You talk about anything you want to talk about as long as you don't demonize the other side. We're okay, let's talk. We have three things we do in that group. Number one, the first thing is we talk about legislation we already have been working on together. Number two, we open it up to any of the members to say, do you have any ideas or any piece of legislation you want to bring to the group? And then the third thing is kind of like open discussion of current events. And we, we meet for about an hour and 20 minutes. We've got a lot accomplished. We now have four bills out, uh, out there. Um, one's a repatriation bill, which basically says, you can bring those profits back over 10 years, because as a CPA, I know that you can't bring them back in one day, and you can't bring them back in two weeks. You gotta have a time to bring them back. But the only way you can get them back here tax-free is you reinvest in payroll, you reinvest in property, you reinvest in plant equipment in America, in the United States. And it has bipartisan support, and it's out there. Uh, we have another bill that uh, was the Employee Act, which basically says if a business employs somebody who's unemployed, 
they should get that unemployment insurance and, they, and pay the unemployed person at least 110 percent of what they're getting on unemployment and let's and they have to train them for the next 90 days so what a great idea and this was a bipartisan idea we have another uh, one out there on housing which basically has tax-free housing accounts that we want to put together so people can live the american dream and still own a house in a time when housing values aren't going up and then uh, uh, mike quigley and i and the group just came up with a, uh, a budget bill which basically changes some things you know right now and i learned this we had this we had the cbo come over and actually talk to our group and i realized that you can hide a lot of things in the 11th year because the CBO is basically a you know, great idea. Let's, let's, let's pass a bill and dump everything in the 11th and 12th year. So one of those things in this and that um, bill is that we do 20-year budgeting, we do biannual budgeting, um, we do revenue. How about this one? How about this one? We do revenue projections and base our budgets based on revenues. Isn't that kind of a unique idea? That's a business idea. But those are the kind of things that, you know, when you start talking to bipartisan group the other members are saying you know what this is something we've done back in Delaware this is something we've done back in our state so long story short it's been great it's been a great working group I do know that there are a lot of us and a lot of people here sitting up here today that want to get things done and, and we need to be able to do that we need to be able to work together so I'm happy to stand here with everybody here and knowing that there is people here in Washington, there are problems people in Washington who want to work together. With that, I'm going to introduce the next speaker, Rich Nugent. Rich is a member of uh, the Florida delegation, also a uh, freshman. Uh, he's been in law enforcement. Of course, Rich, Rich, uh, Rich has been in law enforcement for 28 years. Uh, he's married to his wife, Wendy, with three children. Um, all three of those children serve our country and two of them are at West Point. So with that, I want to introduce you. Thank you. Well, Jim, thank you. It's a, a lot to, uh, to follow. Now, I have the uh, distinct uh, pleasure to introduce uh, all of the uh, members in the, on the panel here. Uh, I want to first thank you, uh, Brooklyn Society, for putting this on. I think it's a great idea. The, uh, the first one is my colleague from Florida, uh, Kathy Kaplan. And uh, she's from the 11th District of Florida, which is Tampa. Uh, she is on the Energy and Commerce Commission, or committee, uh, also the Budget Committee. And she has two wonderful daughters. And we really do appreciate her. And she gets to host the Republican Convention. That's right. <laughs> Spend a lot of money in Tampa if you would, please. Uh, Bobby Schelling, uh, the 17th District from Illinois. He's on Committee for Agriculture. Uh, armed services and small businesses and he has the distinction of being a pizzeria operator and owner uh, in Moline, Illinois, uh, which is kind of not too far from my old stopping grounds. Uh, the neat thing is, is Bobby has finally figured it out. He has 10 children and two grandchildren. So we appreciate Bobby. Uh, Lowe's back. Uh, yes. <laughs> He is uh, with the 2nd District in Iowa, uh, another uh, Midwesterner, which we appreciate, serves on Committee of Armed Services and the Committee on Education and Workforce. And we appreciate it. I think you're in your third, third term. term. Absolutely. Representative Terry, how are we doing? Mm -hmm. uh, from Nebraska, <laughs> Nebraska 2nd, <laughs> serves on the Committee of Energy and Commerce. And uh, here's a neat one. After a survey given to 100 sitting members by the newspaper The Hill, he was voted one of the most bipartisan Republicans on The Hill, quite a reputation. And Representative Mike Ross from Arkansas, we appreciate him, the 4th District, and serves on the Committee of Energy and Commerce. He also serves as a ranking member on the U.S. delegation to the NATO uh, Parliamentary Assembly. And so, Cap. Yeah. Why don't you step on up here? We're going to talk about it if you'd like. I think it'd be easier if everybody steps up here uh, jointly. I'd love to have you talk about what we're doing in Tampa. Great. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Last fall, around September 1st, the Tampa Police Department was wondering where all of the street <coughs> criminals had gone. They weren't picking up people on the street like they used to for drug busts, 
uh, burglaries. <coughs> they wondered where they were. Well, around that time, they made a huge bust in a hotel room where they found uh, these criminals lined up with their laptop computers filing fraudulent tax returns. They had stolen the identities, the social security numbers, um, unsuspecting uh, citizens. Uh, maybe they used Ancestry.com. Maybe there was someone in a nursing home. How awful was that? Someone in a nursing home that took that personal information and sold it to them. But they were filing electronically, mostly under TurboTax. Does anyone file now under TurboTax? Filing fraudulently under TurboTax uh, for a tax refund. They uh, will often file for a tax return that's under $10,000 and doesn't, that doesn't raise uh, suspicions at the IRS. But the volume of these fraudulent returns, uh, the Tampa Police Department believes is just the tip of the iceberg on what's happening all across the country. In that bust alone, they estimated they have, uh, it, they arrested 49 people. They estimate that, that just in that tape, the taxpayers have lost over $100 million. Mm -hmm. They think that's probably just 10% of what's happening in the Tampa Bay area, which means that's a billion dollars. This is happening all over the country. So right away, uh, the uh, police chief contacted me and I thought, well, to get really get something done in Washington, I need someone who's knowledgeable about local law enforcement and is dedicated to the <coughs> constituency in the state of Florida all across the country. And there was no uh, better person than Rich Nugent, who was the former sheriff of Hernando County. Uh, so Rich came down to Tampa. We met with the police chief and the criminal task investigation task force. Uh, they gave us kind of a to-do list, uh, but Sheriff Nugent has such great insight on how to tackle the problem. Uh, we need everyone's help, though, because we filed a bill uh, to address the situation, to increase the penalties for identity theft and tax fraud. But there is one huge loophole, one big hitch. The IRS was not cooperating with local law enforcement or the U.S. Attorney's Office uh, or the Secret Service because the law prevents the IRS from sharing personal tax information with anyone, even local law. So while they've arrested 49 people, they, it looks like now they may only be able to bring one to prosecution. Uh, so uh, Sheriff Nugent uh, and I are, have filed legislation to address that situation and allow the IRS to share that information with local law enforcement in a, in a circumscribed uh, task force, criminal task force, and uh, increase the penalties, and we'll have more work to do and really need everyone's help. Just uh, to follow up, we, we have brought in the IRS criminal and civil divisions into the office to talk to. Uh, we've talked to the Treasury Department, we've talked to U.S. Secret Service, we've, we've had folks from uh, Justice in the U.S. Attorney's Office actually testify in front of the Oversight Committee uh, in regards to this issue. So the whole idea is to bring all the, the folks together that have a part in this issue. And, and, and Kathy has shown great leadership in regards to moving this along. And so it, it, it takes more than just one person to do this. And so we, we've been blessed, uh, but we agree on a lot of issues. And uh, actually, we were at uh, a, a cigar making factory. So, uh, in the Athens district, one of only cigar three. Cigar City. Yep, only, yeah, one, only one of three in the United States. Uh, but, end of the day, it is about bringing all the stakeholders together and talking about those issues so we can do a, a permanent fix. Because, think about it, that one million or hundred million dollars worth of fraud, that's real dollars that are currently sitting in the United States Treasury that you and I have paid into. And so we want to make sure we protect that, particularly when we're talking about cutting, you know, the federal spending. We, every dollar is so much, much more precious. So uh, we appreciate it, and we're going to go to our next uh, folks up. And, uh, I don't have that list, folks.
that. I believe one. Here. Okay, too many pieces of paper. <laughs> So next up is uh, Bobby and Dave, if you would please, you guys take it away. And, and, and one last thing is I do have to herd the cats, so I've uh, given You've got the three to five minutes. Okay. <laughs> three to five minutes, yeah. I'm a former college professor, good luck with that. <laughs> I guess that's already bad. Well, I'm not going to go with one for Good to be here, thank you. Uh, I'm going to say a few general things about bipartisanship a little bit about <coughs> my time here and mention the arsenal issues, Rock Island arsenal issues only briefly, and then Bobby's going to sort of go into a little more detail about the arsenal issues that we've been working on in, uh, in my part of Iowa, his part of Illinois. When I got elected in 2006, I actually defeated one of your longtime members, and you know that all too well, Jim Leach. Um, Jim and I ran a very mutually respectful campaign against one another. I had had Jim in class when I was a college professor a few times. We knew each other quite well. Uh, and uh, we, we ran a very, very good spirited campaign against each other, but it wasn't mean and nasty. And when I got into office, I think it's fair to say that there are many frightened individuals in different communities wondering who this kind of liberal college professor was, how he won, and what the hell he was going to do when he got into office, right? <laughs> Um, so I immediately reached out. The very first group that I met with was a local chamber of commerce because I suspected they might have con some concerns about where I was going to go. I joined the Progressive Caucus, the first thing I did. But I've also, like Peter Welch, I've tried to be what, what I would call a practical progressive. In other words, I'm doing everything I can to do the right thing for the 2nd District of Iowa and for America. Uh, and, and that means often working across the aisle, as I have with Bobby Schilling. You know, people are saying to me, those running against me, well, he votes 90% of the time with the Democrats. Well, I'm a Democrat. Okay? I'm a Democrat. What do you expect? I mean, if you don't want a Democrat, then you don't vote for one of my opponents. But that doesn't mean I can't work with the other side. It doesn't mean that I can't sit down with Bobby Schilling and figure out the best way to move forward the Rock Island Arsenal and all that it stands for, what it does, the great things it does in the Quad Cities area which includes Eastern Iowa, includes Scott County, which will be a part of my new district, and it includes where Bobby lives on the other side of the river. And we've worked really hard to make sure that we can, we can, we can do the things we need to do for the Rock Island Arsenal, maintain that organic manufacturing base, in the event, God forbid, that we have another conflict like Afghanistan or Iraq, and we're both on armed services, and we want to make sure that we maintain the jobs that are there and the skills of those workers who are there, and maybe even increase the number of jobs. So I'm gonna let Bobby sort of go into a little more detail. We're trying to stick to the three to five minutes if we possibly can. And go ahead, Bobby. All right, thank you. Thank you, David. Um, you know, I look at politics a lot like religion. If we, uh, if we all here, Democrats or Republicans, uh, whether you're Catholic, Lutheran, or what have you, is if we focus in on our similarities rather than our differences, we can all be friends. So, uh, but, you know, one of the things I bring that's a unique perspective is the fact that I have 13 years of union background and I'm also a small business owner. So I understand that you have to kind of work together. You can't put one business out or the other. But uh, one of the things that uh, when I got, uh, after I got sworn in, I went to the Rock Island Arsenal and I asked them, I said, what can we do to, to actually uh, secure jobs, make this uh, place a little safer across the board? And they said, well, you know what, Bobby, we've been looking to, for, for 10 years, we've been trying to get three different provisions to put, uh, have put into the, the National Defense Authorization Act. So uh, I reached over to David. David and I went together and started working pretty heavily on it. And uh, we got done in five months what they couldn't get done in 10 years. So uh, the Arsenal was really happy. But, but we proved that you know, Democrats and Republicans can you know, come together on the common ground and really move things uh, quite fast. So uh, for us, I, I believe that you know, that's, that's the big thing that we try to do is reach across the aisle. And you know, we hear a lot of things uh, through the administration saying that the Congress isn't uh, you know, really getting things done. But if you really look at the track record and see what we have gotten done, you know, we've voted on over 900 <coughs> bills. Uh, I think the, the big problem that we have is actually in the Senate where we send things over there and they, they stack this stuff like cordwood. There's bipartisan agreement on that. <laughs> 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 so, but I, I think the big thing is, is the 
try to come together. I'm a member of the Center Isle Caucus. As a matter of fact, we have a, a meeting today. But it's things like that to find the common ground. And you know, we just never know what's going to happen. We, we could be in a meeting, and, and Dave might have an idea, and the light bulb might go off, and uh, or I might have an idea, and he might think I'm half crazy. But until we start to share those ideas, that's it. You're right in the back of the car. On <laughs> but uh, I just really appreciate the opportunity to be here, and I, I really do appreciate uh, what you're trying to accomplish by getting us together so that we can move America forward rather than remain stuck. I can say one more thing. I beat one of your friends, okay, in 2006. He beat one of my friends, Phil Hare. But that doesn't stop me. Candidly. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't stop me. We're working together to do the right thing. And I, and I consider Bobby a friend as well. Uh, and uh, I don't know about if it's the case. He considers me a friend. But anyway. Yes, I do. I do. But no, thanks a lot, everybody. <laughs> Good point in regards to the, uh, the Senate. Last week, you know, we passed a resolution that I brought to the floor of the House, 400, 410 to 1, in calling out the Senate to do the right thing. So uh, it is truly there, and it's truly bipartisan. Uh, so, uh, Representative Lee Terry and Mike Ross will be up next. Thank you. Since I'll be staying and Mike's leaving, I'll go first. So, hello, my name's Lee Terry, and I'm bipartisan. Thank you. We go to the meetings. Yeah, that's the first step of the meeting. I wasn't born that way. It was, it was a choice I made. I observed... Uh, back on my city council days and then here in Congress that if you actually work together and put aside the petty partisan politics, you could get things done. Uh, and so I made a conscious decision that uh, if I was going to initiate a piece of legislation uh, or a meaningful amendment, which there is a difference between some amendments, uh, that I was going to do this in a bipartisan way. And that is, when you have an idea, I may rough it out, I may even have some of the legislative language written, uh, and then I say, who would have a common interest? And we make phone calls and say, hey, you want to join us in this effort? Uh, and it's amazing when you invite or ask people on the other side of the aisle to be part of something that they share it an interest in how you can actually join up. So I consciously made a decision that every one of my bills was going to have a Democrat sponsor uh, and amendment. So my cross, we uh, are politically in tune, just on, sit on different sides of uh, energy and commerce, <coughs> but yet we worked on a lot of issues together, uh, including back to USF days and its beginnings. Um, so. That simply, you have to you have to make a conscious effort out here if you want to be bipartisan. Uh, one point that I'll bring up before I yield uh, the rest of the time to Mike is, it's not easy to be bipartisan in your districts anymore. Now we have seen examples here where we lost on both sides of the aisle people who were bipartisan because they weren't partisan enough. In fact, that's one of the issues that's, uh, you mentioned me being named one of the top 10 bipartisan Republicans, and that is actually being used against me in my uh, primary right now. So uh, we have to do more to change the culture outside of this room uh, because the public is demanding partisanship, at least in our respective primaries. So with that, I'll let Mike talk about about his experiences of being bipartisan. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Lee. I'm Mike Ross, and uh, I'm a Democrat, and I believe in working together. That's why I'm here this morning. But Lee and I have worked on uh, a number of issues uh, together in the <coughs> Commerce Committee. Uh, he'll be the lead R, I'll be the lead D on usually non controversial stuff like the Keystone XL pipeline. <laughs> <laughs> Universal Service Fund, you know, a few non-controversial uh, issues. I didn't know what Lee was going to say this morning. We didn't discuss that, but I actually want to say a little bit about what he said. But before I do, 
Uh, a lot of you know I'm not running again. A lot of you in this room have supported me over the years, and I want to thank you uh, from the bottom of my heart uh, for that. Just my gut, my heart told me after 12 years it was time to go home. Uh, last year was the worst year for Democrats. As you, you all know, in 70 years, we won by 18 percent. Our job approval ratings at 68. I'm not fearful of re-election. I just, for me, I just felt like 12 years was about right. I was in the state senate 10 years before that. So I've been on the ballot for 22 years. That's 22 years of going to festivals and parades every Saturday. <laughs> and, um, and so I'm looking forward to uh, to the to the future. Uh, but I can tell you that serving up here has been the um, the high point in my professional life and something I'll never forget. And we've done a lot of good uh, by uh, working together. But for the new members, let me just tell you that that uh, one thing I observed is is when you first get here. You spend your first year scratching your head wondering, how did I get here? And then you spend the rest of your career scratching your head wondering, how did everybody else get here? <laughs> but one of the things Lee talked about is, I think President Clinton is the one that, that said not all Democratic ideas are good, not all Republican ideas are, are bad. Uh, here's the problem we got, and Lee touched on it. If you don't believe what I'm saying, just ask Blanche Lincoln. Uh, we live in an era now where there are some Republicans that refuse to work with us in a bipartisan manner because they're afraid they'll get a Tea Party opponent. And there are some Democrats who are fearful of working in a bipartisan way because they'll get a move on type opponent. You know, it used to be when I got here, you could, you know, call all y'all and wear the hell out of you and raise $3 million every two years and do your job, and you'd have a pretty level play to deal with your opponent. And now, you've got to do that, and yet you don't know if Karl Rove or move on, depending on which side you're on, is going to show up two to three weeks before the election and dump $5 million. And it's really changing the dynamics of us being able to work together in a bipartisan manner. In my opinion, what complicates this more is redistricting and gerrymandering over the years. We're going through it right now. And where you have a Republican state legislature, guess who got screwed? The Democrats. And when you have a Democratic legislature, guess who got screwed? the Republicans. As a result, there's 435 of us up here. And what's that? Not Florida. Oh, yeah. out of the 400, out of the 400, and I know we've gone over five minutes, but Lee and I talk slower than everybody else, so but yeah, I asked the other two. I'll just make this point and, and be done. That is, out of the 435 of us, there's less than 100 of us that could ever get beat in a general election. Everybody else, all they've got to fear is a party primary. And there were 84 Democrats going into the last election, and they're, they're not the folks that most people were mad at. It was your conservative, moderate Democrats. There were 84 Democrats in Republican-leaning districts. 17 of us survived. And the same thing happens to the Republicans when we take over. And so you've got a very small group that's willing to work together, and we need to grow that group. And quite frankly, I think it's going to be difficult to do as long as you have all these outside influences. Uh, that are coming that are coming into play. So it's an honor to be with you this morning. Thanks for inviting me. I'll tell you what, you guys did great. Um, we're, we're on time by by a minute, and uh, we gave the southern we gave the southern group an opportunity to, but. So since we're out of time and we want to be out of here by nine o'clock in the polls, we have some time, about 14 minutes for questions. So you can direct them to anyone uh, up here if you would, please. I just would like, what advice do you give or what request do you make of your leadership so that you can increase the bipartisanship that you're working on to develop some of the odd work on the tougher issues? facing our country, like the debt and deficit and um, entitlement reform and tax reform. I know that's the, the gorilla in the room, but do you have any advice? Is that possible? Any, any thoughts? Well, I will tell you, in conference, at least the Republican conference, <clears throat> Lee stands up quite often uh, to take a, I think, a, a more measured approach. Uh, there are some within the conference that, you know, uh, want to charge up the hill and, and kill everything in sight. Yes. Um, and and the, I'm sure it's probably on the same side, and obviously I don't sit with the Democratic caucus, so I can't say that for sure, but it is, it's a difficult balancing act. And what you've heard, I was, at least from my question, not up for a year, um, is that that outside money 
um, particularly the Unlimited, is, is probably a game changer in a lot of areas in regards to trying to do the right thing. And, uh, you know, and you're right, you have the Tea Party on, on the far right that is really the time pressure. Thank you. And so, anybody else would like to? Can I just say one thing? Absolutely. You know, I come from this college professor background, and I used to talk about the difference between intellectual rationality and political rationality. And there's very, very little of the former here. I knew that coming in, but it's really scary how bad it is. Um, politicians are inherently risk averse. Well, that's you know, how it is. And, uh, and, and I think the president's on to something about thinking long term. Uh, I think a lot of people want to think long term but it creates a lot of short-term risks in terms of your own political future, and that's really the big problem more than anything else, especially someone in an office where they have to be up for re-election every two years. It, it really gets in the way. There's no, no way around it. And then with all these outside groups who might dump millions of dollars into a race, gee, I don't know who the hell raises three million. There's no way I'm gonna raise three million dollars. I wish I could. But, uh, but, you know, so, help me out, you know. But, uh, but, but that's the big problem, more than anything else. I think a lot of us can sit around and talk about how we can solve the problem long term, but it's really a question of uh, stepping out and saying, okay, you know, there are some short-term risks, but, but we're going to have long-term benefits for the country, uh, for future retirees and all the rest. And that's really the crux of the matter, more than anything else, I think. You know, one of the things I think that uh, we've been involved, you know, that we're up against is, uh, the, the folks out there didn't watch the sausage be made, to be quite forward. And that's why we have all the engagement. But one of the things that we have to be careful of when we talk about the outside groups is, is the government coming in and picking winners and losers. Uh, and for example, you know, you've got <coughs> public sector unions that are getting funded by the government who also, you know, the paychecks come that way and those folks all shift one way. So one of the things, you know, so, some of the ideas that I've heard people say to me is like, look, if you've got a government job, you're being paid by the taxpayer, you shouldn't be able to contribute to any type of campaign. I mean, it, there's a lot of stuff there where you got to worry about your First Amendment rights, things like that. So I think uh, we definitely need to have some type of reform. Another idea that uh, constituent had was that, look, at, if you can't vote for me, then you can't give money. Uh, you know, so there's lots of ideas of trying to figure out the way to do it. You know, when you when I look at uh, you know like the union that I was in, 98% of the money that that we contributed to our union dues uh, actually went to to one side. Uh, so you know we've got to be really fair. So when you when you come across looking at uh, how you're going to uh, pick who's going to give to who, I think you got to make sure it's a fair and balanced way to do it to where uh, one side doesn't have an advantage over the other. Side. Absolutely. Sorry. We all haven't said it, <laughs> but uh, to me, it, 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 it has to be a conscious choice by our leadership. That's right. Uh, and if they aren't willing to make that commitment, right. then we will always have the bitter partisanship. And I, I don't mean to be partisan in my example here, but it's a great example. <laughs> Energy and commerce. Dingle who was very nonpartisan in the way that he chaired the committee, was bumped out to put in the second most partisan person per a, the same ballot, Henry Waxman, whose job was to be a bitter partisan. Now we have Fred Upton. We go back to a Dingle-esque, I think that's in the dictionary, <laughs> way of running the committee, and that was a conscious choice. So it co it, 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 you got to put a lot of this blame on leadership and what they are trying to accomplish. Let's go to another question. Um, I have here, um, not to overlook you, but somebody in the, in the back had their hand up. Oh, never mind. Back to you. Go ahead, Dan. Well, uh, pick up on Dave's risk averse comment, and he did as a Democrat uh, uh, win. The, I guess Republican and the Democrat leading district, Bobby reverse, of course. But on that risk averse point, I'm going to go to Mike since you've been here the longest. We've all done a really good job here of identifying the problem, whether it's reapportionment, whether it's uh, the, the districts that are no longer competitive, the leadership and all that. You're getting out of Dodge. So what's what's the solution that these guys can look for that you don't have to worry about the risk averse part anymore? You can just say. I wish, I wish I knew the answer to that. I think um, um, 
personally, I think the Supreme Court did a terrible injustice on the super PAC business. I mean, you know, and it, and it played a role in my decision not to run again because I'm in a swing district and mine is three million every two years. And then we have to decide what not to do because I've got the rural part of Arkansas. So there's five media markets in the entire state. If you're running statewide, I have to buy four of them. So every week I'm on TV, it's a quarter million dollars. <coughs> and, and, you know, a lot of members can do a week of TV for 50 or 60,000 dollars. There's good and bad to that. Ben Chandler's district's about 60,000 a week. So guess what? They put up 30,000 points against him uh, last year, and he barely, he barely survived. 30,000, I mean, a, a heavy TV buy is usually five to 10,000 points, 30,000 points. And that was from outside groups, not his opponent. And so I think you've got to have some type of campaign finance reform to level the playing field. You can write me a check down for 2,500. You can write a check to a super PAC for two and a half million. How do I compete uh, with that? And quite frankly, the, on the Democratic side, the super PACs that are out there don't get ginned up about helping someone that's as conservative as I am. Ask Blanche Lincoln, you know, and, and uh, sometimes we eat our own. And I'll give you an example of that. The union spent $10 million trying to take Blanche Lincoln out of the primary in 2010. Almost did it, they didn't. But they damaged her enough, that there was no way she could win in November. Now look, from a Democratic perspective, at the problems they've had in Wisconsin in the last two years. I gotta think if that $10 million has been spent in, what, in a state like Wisconsin, they probably had a Democratic governor the last two years, and they would still have a senator that was voting with them 85% of the time. Instead, they've got one voting with them 0% of the time. So sometimes, we have a, a tendency to eat our own, and, and I think maybe that trend's starting a little bit on the Republican side too with, with, the, with the Tea Party, and I would just warn you to be, be careful about, about that. I think that's part of it. I think another part of it is redistricting. I think what would force us to work together is, and John Tanner had a bill on this, it's pretty good. We need to take the politics out of redistricting. It ought to be based on geographical and uh, social, you know, geographical and economic interest. And draw the districts that way, and, and have a, you know, 435. You will never have 435 swing districts, but but you'd have a lot more than 100, and that would force people to work together. I mean, look at it. I mean, John Boehner's got an opponent because they think he's too liberal. Nancy Pelosi's got an opponent because they think she's too conservative. I mean, that's what's going on out there, folks. And in a lot of these districts, where all they have to fear is a is a primary, I think those two things would go a long way uh, toward helping to improve the improve the situation. Can I reinforce that, that second point? You know, Iowa has, I think, the best redistricting process in America. Even though I have to move from my home in Mount Vernon, Iowa, to Iowa City, because I lost one of 15 counties, Lane County, and I gained 10 more, including Scott County, where Rock Island Arsenal uh, is located. It's in Rock, on Rock Island, not Scott County technically, but right there in the river. Um, when I mention risk averse, it's a good thing for politicians sometimes, that they are risk of our skilling for the country because folks are more likely to work together across the aisle in a situation like that. And in Iowa, I won, as you said, it was a Democratic leaning district, although virtually nobody helped me. Uh, I won in large part because of my own efforts, but also because it was a good district for a Democrat against someone who's not unpopular. He was, the polling we had said that he had a 60% favorable rating when I was running against him. But it was a year, 2006, when it was more partisan and Democrats came home and they voted for me in that situation. Now, my district is more competitive than it was before. I'm on the front line. That's a good thing, I think, in some ways, although my chief staff here doesn't want to hear that. <laughs> right? It means I do have to raise a lot more money. But, but I think it does force us to, to, to work across the aisle, too. You know, I, I like to say I want to do that because it's the right thing and all, and it is, okay? But it's also something that I think is probably necessary uh, as well. Although I would have done this no matter what, because I'll be representing the Quad Cities. And I already went up to the Rock Island Arsenal even before I represented it, because I'm on the Armed Services Committee, and I think it's important to do that. But having a redistricting process, as hard as it is for California, that, that they're kind of approximating what Iowa did, and look at what it's doing. I think it's great what's happening in California. My California colleagues don't want to hear me say that. But I think that's the way to go. It forced my opponent in 2006 to relocate from his boyhood home of Danport to Iowa City. It forced me to move from Mount Vernon to Iowa City. My wife doesn't like that. The, my realtor likes it because she was Jim Leach's realtor. When the redistricting happened, I told her I wanted her to be my realtor. I said with one caveat. She said, what's that, Dave? 
and said, you're not going to make as much money off the sales you did off Jim Leach's. Uh, about one third or one fourth. But at any rate, um, I think that redistricting is often, the, is probably more than anything else the key to this, to have more competitive districts. I agree completely. Thank you. Well, I, we're just about out of time. I have one last question. And, and in the sea of men, I'd like to direct it to Congresswoman Castor. All right. And All right. that is this. Uh, we had, about uh, a month ago, we had uh, Senator Lisa Murkowski and Mark Udall. Lisa said that on a regular basis, the female senators get together and talk about different things. Is there something, and, and it is also a bipartisan thing, is this something that they do in the House? Because, as you know, women look at things a lot differently than guys do. And is there something, is, is there something that women do in the House that, that the guys are not doing? Yeah, you know, behind the scenes, many of us uh, are very good friends. And uh, many of you are aware that we have started a bipartisan uh, softball team. Now, that's House and Senate, uh, Republican and Democrat. And we'll start up here over the next month or two with our practices, where we go and practice at 7 a.m. every morning. And um, let me tell you, Ileana ross Layton in the outfield, this is terrific. <laughs> and um, uh, Senator Ayotte has now come on to the team. We need some more of the, uh, re the new Republican women, though, in the House. Uh, many of them uh, did not participate because they were kind of getting acclimated. But uh, I anticipate many more of them come. You know, when you, when you have that opportunity outside of the floor of the House or your committee with the... Uh, with, you kind of have the uh, legislative warfare, it makes all the difference in the world to build those personal uh, connections where you can talk about other things other than um, your political race or, or that piece of legislation. It, making those personal connections where you can talk about your families, uh, talk about the challenges you have from housing here uh, in Washington, things like that, it makes all the difference in the world. So, there aren't many other opportunities uh, to do that. You're not really encouraged to go and socialize together. Uh, so we need more of those type of opportunities. And last year, I want you all to know that the, um, the women of the Congress did defeat uh, the women of the press for the first time. We'll play that one here. Chair Nugent, thank you very much, gentlemen. Kathy, thank you all very much, and thank you, staff, for coming out to be with us.